Welcome to today's OR Today webinar. We have a great presentation featuring Michelle Lemon, OR Clinical Educator for Key Surgical. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Key Surgical. They are a leading global provider of sterile processing, operating room, and endoscopy products that support processes and procedures in hospitals and surgical facilities throughout the U.S. and internationally. For more information, visit keysurgical.com. OR Today joins the World Health Organization in celebrating the 200th anniversary of Florence Nightingale's birth and the Year of the Nurse in 2020. As part of this celebration, OR Today wants to feature nurses in a new contest. Every entry wins a gift card. To enter, we ask that you visit ortoday.com slash contest to share a time when a nurse serves as an inspiration to you or your team. More details on this contest can be found on the handout section of your webinar dashboard. Today's webinar is eligible for one continuing hour by the State of California Board of Registered Nursing. You can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE hour, and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. As I mentioned earlier, our presenter today is Michelle Lemon. She will detail general considerations for surgical positioning, revisit the published guideline recommendations, and discuss risk and prevention of risks for the supine, supine prone, and Fowler's position. Injury prevention and emergency preparation are some of our best tools to help patients have successful surgical outcomes. Michelle, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you so much. What a nice introduction. And hopefully everybody goes on and fills out a story about a nurse. That's an incredible contest and opportunity. So let's get going. Um, I'm very honored that you all have decided to spend an hour of your day with me today. I'd like to just take a minute to introduce myself and tell you a little, about, a little bit about myself and who I am outside of this webinar. I am a nurse, as you all already know, and I've been a nurse for over seven years, but I'm also married to a nurse. This is an image of my husband, Josh. We have two kids, Jackson and Opal. Um, and as you can tell, they are energetic and fun and really keep the joy and humor alive and well in our lives. I've worked in almost every aspect of nursing from admissions to surgery to acute care and post-acute care. And if you know me, you know that I am passionate about nursing and advocacy and education, which makes my current role as a nurse clinical educator just really fun and a big honor to be able to be here and speaking with you today. Before we get into the details, um, I, we always cover this quick disclaimer. We do our due diligence um, to provide you with the best and most up-to-date information and guidelines and research. But that being said, this, re this education does not take the place of your facility's policies, any published guidelines or standards. So we always wanna follow those. Our objectives for today during this presentation are to name the primary goals and expected outcome of surgical positioning. We'll discuss patient specific information to review prior to positioning. We'll discuss the specifics, the guideline recommendations and complications of the supine, fowlers and prone positions. And we will detail the post-procedure evaluations for these, each of these positioning types. <clears throat> so to start, I'm gonna do an interactive exercise with you, even though I won't be able to see your reactions. I'd like you to close your eyes. Of course, I can't tell if you are, so you don't have to, but take note of your position and actively try not to move anything. Don't move your fingers, your toes, don't uncross your legs or shift your bottom in your chair. How are you sitting? Is your body supported? 
if you had to sit like this for one hour, what would happen at the end of that hour? Would you have numb fingers or if you crossed your legs, would that dependent foot just be cold and tingling? Um, if you're really up for the big challenge, try it. Try to sit through the hour of this presentation and not move any part of your body. And the reason, even though this seems a little dramatic to do at the beginning, I would like to cover this right at the beginning because truly throughout this presentation, we're going to discuss some of the physiologic injury, damage, reversible and not that can occur related to improper positioning. And while this seems a little funny to do, it's important to always keep in mind with patient positioning that anesthetized patients cannot make the team aware of compromised positions. Um, my husband is 6'4", so when he falls asleep on the couch, his feet are dangling over and he wakes up and complains for two hours because they're in pain and they're cold. So I really want to set up our presentation today with that mentality. They're not going to be able to tell us. And I also think it's kind of fun and interesting and challenging to try to do that ourselves, which I'm a hand talker, so I will not be doing it. But in all of our associations and regulatory body guidelines, there are statements about education, initial and ongoing education requirements regarding surgical positioning. So I kind of just want to call out at the beginning that this is a recommendation and a guideline for each of us that's in the operating room. AORN or the Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses has guidelines about it. The Association of Surgical Technologists, NPUAP, and if you can tell me what this means before I say it, you get 10 points, but that's the National, National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. The American Society of Anesthesiology and all of your facilities policies and procedures will have something to say about ongoing education. So I like to call that out. Here's an example. This is AORN's guidelines. It says healthcare facilities should provide personnel who have responsibility for positioning patients with initial and ongoing education and competency verification activities related to patient positioning and as well AST. The surgical team should be familiar with the goals of achieving safe and effective positioning of the surgical patient. For this presentation in particular, we will cover quite a few guidelines. I'm going to read through most of them. Some of them I will summarize, not because I think you don't know or because of, of really any other reason besides these are here to guide us. Perfect example, AST is free. Their guidelines are free online to download. AORN spends every single year, they update their research and guidelines to reflect the most current best practice. I think it's a great way that we all maintain our accountability and communication with one another based on updated research. There can be many personalities in the operating room and generations, and sometimes we have that dialogue of, well, I've always done it like this. And using our guidelines as a support can help you if you're not as assertive or if you really don't know what the best guideline is at the time. Our guidelines are a great resource for that. So let's get started and talk about pre-procedure positioning considerations. What do we need to think about before we do anything else for positioning? I like to say that OR staff and most healthcare professionals, but specifically to the OR, are always preparing for that worst case scenario. What might I need? Who am I working with? Who's my patient? And really working to avoid detrimental um, outcomes. So the first consideration is pretty straightforward. What procedure are you going to do? How long is it? And what position does the patient have to be in? Um, and do they need to be repositioned at all during the procedure? <clears throat> As an experienced nurse, this would happen probably within about five seconds. You wouldn't even really think about it. You know what position and what's gonna happen because you've done it before. But newer nurses don't, and, and it's a, an important pause for consideration. The second pre-procedure positioning consideration is the brief. The brief is the touch point with the full team prior to the procedure, and this provides specific insight and those deviations from normal that the surgeon, anesthesiologist, CRNA, nurse, or tech needs the team to know. This is a great point to communicate with one another. It's also a great time to tease out any barriers that you might face during the case. 
one of one of the surgeons that I worked with very frequently had the common statement of I always do it the same way. So the brief was a great opportunity for me to ask specific questions because he did not, in fact, always do it the same way. But the brief was that opportunity to say, oh, do you need this today um, to prepare myself to get ready? Third is equipment, not only positioning equipment, bed equipment and things like that, but also thinking through the case. So you're gonna have to do an X-ray or, or different things like that. What do you possibly need ready and how can you position the room in the best way possible? If you're like me, you also have a backup of all those things that you might need for equipment. Fourth is the anesthesia. <clears throat> it's having that conversation with the CRNA and anesthesiologist what do they need specific for the case and, and really having that touch base. Sometimes this is as minimal as they walk in the room and walk out and you just have a, a very brief touch point or it's during the brief. The fifth is the surgeon. While it may fall into the brief, it's also important to get to know your surgeon. What is their temperament? What is their requirements for the room? Um, a lot of pick lists that I've seen or, or surgeon cards are not up to date as they should be or as possible. So it's great to whoever knows that surgeon or has worked with them best um, can fill in the rest of the team. And following right after that is your team. This includes anesthesia and surgeon, but are you working with a good friend? You'll have to kind of avoid talking about your weekend or are you working with someone that you don't get along with as well. Just taking a moment while you're going to assess the patient or while you're getting equipment ready and preparing yourself for the room that you're about to enter. I, the very shameless plug here, we have tons of education about communication and leadership and bullying in the workplace and things like that. But right before the case is not the time to try to change that tone. It's really the time to take a second and center yourself and consider your team for that day, strengths and weaknesses, and prepare for that and really get going. And last but certainly not least is the patient. Let's go through a, uh, a list of the pre-procedure assessments for our patients. So in accordance with our guidelines, the pre-procedure assessment should include all of this list, but at a minimum. There are many other things we're gonna be thinking of. So. We need to know the patient's age, height, weight, BMI, and nutritional status, their skin condition, accessories, including the presence of jewelry, prosthetics or devices, internally implanted devices, or any physical or mobility limitations. We need to know their allergies, pre-existing conditions, and lab results. And of course, the, the presence of peripheral pulses, the perception of pain, can they feel pain in certain areas, their consciousness, and then their psychosocial and cultural well-being requests considerations. Each of these assessment points can impact positioning, it can impact complications, and it can impact the outcomes. On top of all of that, it was my favorite time to go and put my eyes on the patient. There, that's an invaluable assessment. So are they nervous? Are they comfortable? Are they delusional, but their chart says they're alert and oriented? Knowing all of that is very valuable. We once cared for a very uh, strong, very muscular young 30-year-old male who had had multiple previous procedures. And during my assessment, he was able to communicate that he wakes up very aggressively from anesthesia. He also said during induction, it's better for him if he has metal music playing. Um, and that was very helpful to take care of that patient, to know his specific needs. So during induction, we did. We had metal music playing, and he was calm and collected. And then waking up from anesthesia, we were able to have quite a few extra hands on deck, which ended up being very valuable. So this pre-procedure assessment is not only for the details of their body, but also their mind and how they're preparing for surgery. After this pre-procedure assessment, of course, communication. We all need to get on the same page about what our patient needs, where they're at, and what's going on. So this is kind of that shared goal mentality. So we'll cover here the, just the details, the goals of patient positioning, overarching goals. The number one and most obvious goal is, of course, creating optimal surgical site exposure. 
But on top of that, the goals for patient positioning are maintaining neutral body alignment, providing for patient dignity, which also helps us to um, maintain body or re regulate body temperature to help do that. And also managing the airway and ventilation and providing for physiologic safety. Many positions, while modifiable to the procedure or surgeon needs, can actually lead to undesired or preventable physiologic consequences, whether that's musculoskeletal injury, um, nerve damage, or respiratory and cardiovascular compromise. On top of all of just the positioning, anesthesia does blunt our compensatory mechanisms, which leaves the patients vulnerable to position, positional changes. And as we stated at the beginning, anesthetized patients are not able to communicate these changes. Once again, back to our guidelines, it's the AOR, AORN guidelines support that verifying the patient's body is in physiological alignment when the patient is positioned and additionally AST. The goals of positioning the surgical patient are ensuring comfort and dignity, maintaining homeostasis, protecting anatomical structures and avoiding complications and injuries, promoting access to the surgery site, promoting access for the administration of IV fluids and anesthetic agents, and promoting access of OR surgical equipment. So all the things we just covered. Now, once the patient is positioned, we also need to consider the post-positioning assessment. So after the patient is in position, the perioperative RN, RN and the team should reassess the body, make sure that everything is where you intended it to be. There's no Mayo stand or table leaning against the patient. There's no person leaning against the patient, which has happened. And just all those other areas where we would not undue risk. We don't want all of that extra pressure or anything on our patients. Once again, our guidelines support this. Monitor the patient's position after positioning activities and during the procedure and take corrective action as needed. And AST supports this as well with some very explicit instructions. Once again, AST, they have great resources online and very detailed instructions, which is great. So now I know you're seeing the title of this slide and thinking, okay, Michelle, I already know about documenting. We've all heard this before, but I will say it again. If it wasn't charted, it didn't happen, even if it did. There's no trail of that. There's no way that anybody else could know that it happened. So document, document, document. Things happen really fast in the OR. I've seen an entire back table get pushed off like a waiter removing a tablecloth in the event of an emergency. Things can happen in the blink of an eye, and sometimes the blur can cause you to forget important steps and important details. So some important details to always include with positioning are who positioned the patient, who was present, including the surgeon and anesthesiologist that okayed the positioning, any positioning devices used, of course, their actual position, any special attention that was paid, like extra padding on a bruise or a foam dressing to the coccyx, all of that needs to be included. And the times that the patient was evaluated during the procedure. <clears throat> I realize that sitting down at the start of a procedure is not a realistic idea, but documentation is still possible and necessary using what you have. I don't know about each of you listening, but the <laughs> pass cards from sterile gowns became my notebook in the operating room. I loved them. The names of a new resident I had never seen before or a guest or a rep in the OR. I was able to write it down, get it off my mind, and then go document it later as soon as possible in the chart. And now that we know our procedure, we've had the brief, we've prepped the room and completed our communication with our patient and our team, there's one final note before we position the patient. A patient who's been placed on the OR table must never be abandoned. It's something that seems very logical and unfortunately it does happen. They must be monitored at all times, and actually, if the patient is ever left alone on the operating room table, the entire surgical team can be liable for abandonment. According to AST guidelines, at a minimum, the circulating nurse and anesthesia care provider should be in the OR at all times with a patient on the operating room table. 
I really believe that patient positioning is the epitome of the art and science of healthcare, but how you show up to the room is very important. It's taking that second to center yourself and get ready before you position the patient, keeping them as your top priority. That is the beginning, the start of a successful positioning and procedure. So let's get down to business and talk about the specifics of surgical positioning. We're gonna talk supine, fowlers, and prone. For each position, as we stated before, we're gonna discuss why it is used, just a few common procedures it's used for, the requirements for the position and considerations for the post-procedure evaluation. Also just a few common complications for each of these. So let's start with the most popular, the most common positioning, and that is supine. The supine position is of course, the most common surgical position. The patient is lying on their back with neutral body alignment maintained. The head and neck should be supported to reduce pressure, but also without hyperextending the neck. A pillow should be placed between behind the knees, providing five to 10 degrees of elevation, but according to the guidelines, not more than 20. So kind of watching that. This will relieve pressure placed on the lower back as well as nerves in the low back and, and that run along the legs. The heel should be elevated to prevent pressure injury on the heel and also aid in circulation. And the safety strap on the lower extremities should be placed with what I personally call the two by two rule. The person applying the strap should be able to comfortably insert two fingers in the midsection of the strap after it's tightened so that it's not over tightened. And as well, the strap should be placed two inches above the knees. These safety restraints help to secure the body and limbs in a safe position on the OR table, prevent rolling or any limb falling off. But with that said, if they're over tightened, they can actually cause nerve and circulation damage. These are a great one to talk about the IFU or instructions for use. Whenever you're using a new device, equipment, anything, you should locate and read through the IFU to know that you're applying it and using it correctly. The, um, the arm boards should be padded to protect the nerves and pressure points. And if the arms are abducted or moved away from the body, they should not exceed 90 degrees away from the body. We'll talk about this more a little bit in the complications, but that can actually, it's actually linked very closely to brachial plexus nerve injury and damage. Palms should be supinated, also facing up, if you wanna say it like that. And according to our guidelines, the finger should be fully extended. Arms should be secured again with a safety strap, not over joints or articulating points. And again, a great opportunity to talk about and follow the IFU and not over tighten so that we don't cause nerve or compression damage. With any and all surgical positions, the entire patient's body should be adequately supported and padded. No part of the body should be hanging off or resting against the metal or hard surfaces of the bed. Just like we talked about at the beginning, my husband's feet hanging over the couch or maybe your hands right now if you're accepted my challenge to not move, um, it hurts it can, it, it can cause real damage to the patient. So very interesting to me and hopefully to you is, is changes in guidelines. And this is kind of what we talked about at the beginning. These guideline changes are here to help us. It's not that idea of I've always done it this way, so I'm going to do it this way. We do have new, new research that comes out all the time. And these guidelines do an incredible job of supporting that and communicating it to us so that we can use best practice. So this AORN guideline, this first slide is from 2016. And actually AORN called out and said, unless necessary for surgical reasons, the patient's arm should not be tucked at their sides when in supine position. And then it went on to detail if there are surgical reasons how to do that. And actually AORN updated this in 2020 to eliminate calling out not to tuck the arms. In fact, they went into in detail how to do that safely. So they said that patient, place the patient's arms in a neutral position with palms facing the body without hyperextension of the elbows. Protect the patient's elbows and hands with extra padding. Pull the draw sheet up between the patient's body and arm and place it over the patient's arm. 
and tuck it between the patient and the OR mattress, which I thought was a great call out. We only want the patient's own body weight as pressure. Again, nerves and circulation and pressure points, thinking through all of that. Tuck the draw sheet snugly enough to secure the patient's arm, but not so tight as to become a pressure source. Extend, extend the draw sheet from the mid upper arm to the fingertips. They also included a note more in detail about not over tightening. So these guidelines are really here to help us and support us and continue our practice forward with, with safety for our patients. Both AORN and AST guidelines have specific recommendations regarding hand and arm positioning, and they both support that the arm should be placed on padded arm boards, again, calling out that less than 90 degree angle for the supine position, and that palms should be facing up with fingers extended. So this image is an example of a lead hand. Now these can be used for hand specific procedures, but also to maintain the extension of the fingers. So without stretching or adding extra compression to the nerves or pressure to the fingers, this can be used to keep their fingers extended. The guidelines also call out sh that shoulder abduction and lateral rotation should be kept to a minimum. And again, extremity should not drop below the bed level or the procedure level. So arms and hands should not rest on metal or any hard position on the bed. And once again, take a good look at the patient. Is anything leaning, pushing on the patient at any time that can cause damage? This is that AST guideline we talked about just a second ago with palms up and fingers extended, not curled up towards the palm. So the post-procedure assessment of the patient in the supine position will include many more things than we'll talk about during this presentation, but at a very basic level, we always wanna take a look at the pressure points and then the common nerve injury or damage locations for each position. So in the supine position, the primary pressure points are the thoracic vertebrae. Again, they're laying all their body weight on a bone that's close to the surface. The back of the head or the occiput. The scapula, the elbow or lecranon process, the sacrum and the heels. So these are all places where the bones are close to the surface of the skin and we're adding extra pressure to them. The brachial plexus, lumbosacral nerves, peroneal nerve and ulnar nerve are at risk for injury in the supine position. So we'll have a pop quiz, which I wish I could hear you all answering me back. What is the most common perioperative nerve injury? Is it to the lumbosacral nerve, the ulnar nerve, the brachial plexus, or the peroneal nerve? I'll give you a second to answer for yourselves. It's actually ulnar nerve injury as the most common. According to a 2016 article in Anesthesia Key, the most common nerve injuries sustained in the perioperative period are in order ulnar nerve injury, brachial plexus injury, lumbosacral nerve damage, and then common perineal nerve damage. While sensory injuries are more common than motor and sensory injuries, they can both occur. And while it's more common that these nerve injuries are transient, lasting five days or less post-procedure, they can be damaging and detrimental. So some of those common causes of ulnar nerve damage or injury are just like we've said many times, if the elbow slips off the mattress and hangs on the bed, compressing the nerve between the bone and the table. Brachial plexus damage can be caused by extreme positions of the head and arm, hyperextending the arms over that 90 degrees, and then again, arms falling off. <clears throat> Lumbosacral nerve damage can be caused by flexion at the hip or pressure, stretching, any of that. And proper positioning of the head and neck can really um, mitigate this risk and reduce that risk of injury a lot. So it's important to be thinking through not only the pressure points, but the nerves and other common injury sites. Now let's talk about a variation of the supine position, and that's Fowler's position. One of the most interesting things I think in medicine is, is where things get their name. I think there's an entire podcast about it, which is super interesting, but 
Fowler's position was actually named for the surgeon who's credited with discovering position. And his name was George Ryerson Fowler. And he discovered that elevating the head of his patients, the head and upper body, actually reduced mortality in his patients with peritonitis. The Fowler's position provides access to the shoulder, posterior surgical spine, and the posterior, posterior and lateral head. And it's often used in shoulder and neurological surgical procedures. Fowler's position also allows for better lung excursion and diaphragmatic activity. And this is especially helpful for patients with respiratory or cardiac compromise. Also patients who have an NG tube or a nasogastric tube that cannot, be, cannot lie flat. So prior to the procedure, and we'll look at the guideline in a second, um, guidelines actually do support using a silicone foam dressing on the sacrum or patting the coccyx before placing the patient in this position. A true Fowler's position is a head or torso elevated 45, between 45 and 60 degrees. The head should be padded again to reduce pressure, but also very much considering not twisting and hyperextending to do damage to that brachial plexus. A padded footboard should be placed to prevent sliding, but also to reduce pressure on the bottom of the feet and to maintain the angle that you want for the feet. <clears throat> the heel should be elevated to reduce pressure and also aid in circulation. One of the complications for this position is pooling of blood in the lower extremities, so this can help with that. The arms can either be placed on arm boards at the side of the body, following those same guidelines as supine, not over 90 degrees, ideally less than 60 degree angle. But alternately in this position, the arms can be bent at the elbow and laid across the patient's abdomen on a pillow, taking good care not to cross the arms on top of each other or set them on top of each other. And especially in this position, it's important to think about the elbow as we're having gravity work against us and, and the bony prominences are exposed more. A pillow should be placed behind the knees, once again, to reduce pressure on the low back and stretching or pressure on the nerves that run along the low back and legs. And the safety strap on the lower extremities should be placed once again by that two by two rule with that two finger breath underneath after it's been tightened. In this position, the safety strap should not be placed until the patient is fully positioned just to reduce the risk of friction and shearing. So there's many variations of the Fowler's position. This is a great question for your brief. Um, what degree or what angle do you, you want your patient at? The low Fowler's is considered a 15 to 30 degree elevation. Semi Fowler's is 30 to 45 degrees and high Fowler's can be between 60 to 90 degrees. So great question for the brief and also very, very important to document in the chart. What angle of the bed were they actually at? In the Fowler's position, the common pressure points are, once again, the occiput, the back of the head, shoulder blades, the low back, the elbow, the olecranon process, sacrum and ischial tuberosities, the heels, and in this position, also the bottom of the feet. The primary nerves at risk are the brachial plexus, the ulnar nerve, and the sacral nerve with that pressure being put on the bottom. So some other common complications in this position or risks are poor venous return from the lower extremities and actually blood pooling in the pelvis. And another thing you can see is hypotension. One of the most concerning risks of, of this position or the most concerning complications is a venous air embolism. And this slide is about to have a lot of information. I'm gonna read through them, but I also would like, if you're often doing procedures with a patient in Fowler's position, this should definitely be an area. Screenshot this page, send me an email and I'll send you the resources that I have, but also policies and guidelines and procedures for your facility, lots of conversations with your team. And um, just really knowledge is power in this instance, especially knowing the symptoms and knowing the interventions can help you to intervene early and really save a patient. So a venous air embolism can occur when air or gas is drawn into circulation by the veins above the level of the heart. 
And research has shown that the incidence of a VAE or venous air embolism is actually significantly higher in this sitting position at 41.3% compared to horizontal positions like prone and lateral, which is 11%. So historically, VAE is most common associated with sitting position craniotomies, but the risk of a VAE is higher in any procedure where the operative site is higher than the right atrium. So just really keeping that in mind, this can be a complication if you're doing a procedure like that. Very dangerous complication can cause ischemia and even death. So the most important thing here is that operating room staff must recognize at the beginning that there is an increased risk for this complication, recognize what the symptoms are, and then no interventions. So some of the symptoms of a VAE, and this is not an exhaustive list, even though it kind of looks like it, are tachyarrhythmias, ST and T changes, peaked P waves, hypotension, increased pulmonary artery pressure, and increased central venous pressure, they might be. Another one is, is jugular vein distension. And if none of this is addressed, the patient can go into shock. So learning the symptoms, watching for them, keeping it at front of mind when you have someone in this position. The Association of Anesthesiologists and AORN both include excellent lists of interventions. What I will say is just at the beginning of this whole thing, these, these interventions are not immediate. This needs to be first and first and first communication. Communicate with your team, communicate with your surgeon, anesthesiologist, CRNA, get everybody on the same page and, about, and, and the goals. So really intervening as a collective team is going to be very effective. One of the first things that they both suggest, ASA and ARN, is oxygenating the patient with 100% oxygen, filling or packing the surgical wound. You want to prevent any more air from going in to that area. If possible, placing the patient in left lateral, lateral and Trendelenburg position. Again, if possible, ex extracting or removing that air embolus if, if you're able to. Initiating compressions that can help break up that air administering fluids and pressors, doing a TEE, and then entitl CO2. So all of these, again, screenshot, email me, I'll send you all the information that I have, and I'm happy to, to walk you through what I know. But if you're doing many Fowler's positions, really get comfortable with the symptoms and the intervention. There's no greater power than knowing what to do in advance. That's an excellent tool. This is in reference to VAE. This is part of the AORN guidelines that talks about successful treatment requires prompt recognition and rapid simultaneous implement, implementation of multiple interventions by perioperative team. If not diagnosed and treated immediately, these can be fatal. In an excellent free article titled Diagno Diagnosis and Treatment of Vascular Air Embolism, ASA details exactly what to look for and exactly what to do as a team if you suspect that you have a VAE. So please take the time and, and learn more about it. But we'll give you a little overview. The final position we'll cover today and probably the most popular position of 2020 is prone position. <clears throat> The prone position is, is typically used for access to the back of the skull, the spine, the buttocks, the perineal area, and lower extremities. During the coronavirus pandemic, this position has been used increasingly and showcased on the media as the prone position produces an increase in functional and residual capacity, improves ventilation, and can consequently improve oxygenation. So this position has been used quite a bit. In this position, as any other position in the operating room, the patient will be intubated in supine position. The ET tube will be secured, and then the patient will be repositioned face down on the OR table by an absolute minimum of four care providers. The anesthesia provider the entire time only focusing on the airway and supporting the head. It's their only job. So in this position, the patient's head should be straight forward or can be to the side but maintaining that cervical neck alignment, 
and avoiding excessive flexion or extension of the head. Once again, the brachial plexus and thinking about cerebral blood flow and perfusion. A padded headrest should be used to provide airway access. Prone head positioners are um, very specific. So using a, pos a head positioner for prone position, this will also help reduce the pressure on the eyes, the chin and the forehead. Arms may be tucked similar to supine or abducted on padded arm boards. The arms should be placed lower than the chest. The arms and wrists should be in neutral alignment and the elbows should be flexed. The arms, once again, should not be placed above the patient's head and not beyond 90 degrees. Arms should be secured to the arm boards to prevent rolling, falling off, leaning against hard portions of the bed, and again, not over tightened. Place the patient on two chest supports. Now we'll talk about this in a little bit in the complications, but really, really, really appropriately placing these is a huge, is a huge important thing. So they should run from the clavicle to the iliac crest. And actually these chest supports can permit abdominal expansion and they decrease intra-abdominal pressure as well as in the thorax. So check at this time the position of the breasts and the genitalia. You don't want torsion or pressure on any of those places of the patient you can't see. The patient's knees should be padded to reduce pressure. The shins should be elevated to to reduce pressure, not only on the toes, but also aid in circulation. And there's some nerve damage that's been associated with foot drop in, if they're not supported. So after covering the non-operative area, providing that dignity and maintaining the body temperature again, um, once again, place that safety strap by the two by two rule. Some, some places do put more than one safety strap on the lower extremities, follow your policies and procedures for that. Excuse me. Here we go. A free replay. So the post-procedure considerations or assessment for the prone position. The prone position has the longest list of, of pressure sites, I guess, but a lot of facilities will actually have a silicone foam dressing kit that's specific for this position. And I just think that's a great idea if you're gonna implement a new tool in your OR or if you're on your skincare team or something like that. Those are great ideas for facilities. So our pressure points are forehead, chin, eyes, which we're gonna cover more in detail in a second, the clavicle, wrist, elbow, chest and genitals, once again, their full body weight, the iliac crest, the knees, and the dorsal feet and toes can all be at risk. So there is 13 pretty serious complications that are called out in the guideline and research for prone position, including compartment syndrome of the abdomen and stroke. But one of the most frequently discussed complications is that of the eyes or the ophthalmic complications and the respiratory complications. <clears throat> so in this position, there is ri increased risk for direct comp compression to the orbit and also corneal ab abrasions for the eye. So the pressure from this position can actually cause compartment syndrome in the eye and um, corneal tears that are can cause irreversible vision loss. A few of the things we wanna do to protect the eyes in this position. Each of our guidelines calls out avoiding a horseshoe shaped positioner. These type of positioners should not be used for the head in the prone position. It can cause that direct pressure on the eyes. Another um, guideline is to apply lubricant to the eyes prior to taping them. And when they are taped, they should be taped horizontally. A good call out for here is using a mirror to evaluate the head position as they're face down. So you're able to see um, the position that their head, eyes, forehead, chin, all of that is supported without undue pressure. And then if possible for your procedure, placing the patient in reverse Trendelenburg or feet down by five to 10 degrees if possible can reduce that pressure on the eyes and in the head. The second common complication in the prone position is actually respiratory and circul circulatory compromise. And while we talked about at the beginning, some of the reasons we put a patient in this position is to actually 
help diaphragmatic activity and breathing, but incorrect placement of those positioners can actually cause obstruction in the areas that we're trying to open up. So the number one is positioner placement, making sure, ask another person, use your teammates that those position, those positioners are in the right place. I've said this before, I'll continue to say it. You are the only you in the OR. If you notice something, if something seems off, say something, communicate it, talk with your team. Communication, right? Everybody should be on the same page for where things are and what's going on with that patient. Doing your evaluations every two hours at minimum, the patient who's positioned on the operating room table should be reevaluated for any pressure or any other concerns. And our guidelines support that actually reducing the prone time as you're able to will reduce the risks, of course, of all of these. This is that AORN guideline, intraocular pressure increases in the anesthetized patient in the prone position. And the magnitude of this increase is related to the amount of time spent in prone position. AORN as well, place the patient in prone position for the shortest time possible. AST guidelines support the same, that the eyes are a particular risk. And AST guidelines call out specifically arm placement in the prone position. I know that we have covered a ridiculous amount of information. And for those of you who maintained your position the whole time, please tell us how you're feeling, your feet, your arms, all of that. I, I just really wanna say that I absolutely appreciate your time today. Um, I loved this quote. I thought it was perfect for the OR and positioning. This was by Phil Jackson, who is a former professional basketball player. He was actually the head coach of the Chicago Bulls and the Lakers and is an executive in the NBA. And he said, the strength of the team is in each individual member, but the strength of each member is in the team. And I felt that there was nothing more true for the operating room, for patient safety and for patient positioning. We all really rely on each other and need each other to have safe surgery. I think we have a few minutes for Q&A, if you guys had any questions. We do, Michelle. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, as a reminder to our audience, if you would like to ask a question, please use the question feature on your webinar dashboard. We do have a few questions that have come in uh, so, Michelle, let's start with those. What is the best way to position the arms in the supine position? Sure. So, just like we talked about with those AORN guidelines, I will say the best way to position the arms in supine is the way that follows those guidelines. Tucking with the um, sheet only underneath the patient's body, watching that the fingers may remain extended, which can be very hard. Often when you apply that safety strap, the fingers kind of curl on their own. So keeping those fingers extended, making sure that that arm is not lying on a hard or firm surface of the bed is the best way, whatever is the best and safest way for that procedure, but also following those guidelines. Thank you. Um, our next question is, we often have a brief that contradicts the surgeon's pick list. I am a new OR tech. How do I start to learn when each surgeon wants? Okay, so like what, how, what each surgeon's specific things if the pick lists are wrong. Pick lists from other facilities that I've seen, they don't get updated as much as they should. So of course I would promote getting involved and getting those updated, but also finding out the people on your team who are trustworthy, asking questions. There truly is no stupid question ever. Ask people, what do they like? How do they do it? And then take your own notes. I had a, a binder full. I had an incredible OR team of people who had worked with the surgeons for quite a while. And I just kept my own notes. And then when I was at a level where I could perform the procedures and I and I felt confident, I I think you should get involved in changing those pick lists, updating them. 
That's great. Thank you. Our next question is, where can I find the information you have discussed about VAE? Absolutely. I would love to send you the reference list. Also, like I said, a ASA has an incredible, that free article, which I can send you. AORN guidelines, AST guidelines. There's a ton of incredible research that's out there about this. And if you're doing procedures in Fowler's position quite a bit and you're interested in learning more, um, I would love to send you those if you send me an email that's on the screen, education at keysurgical.com or just really start, I would start with the guidelines instead of kind of blindly doing a Google search because those guidelines can send you to those research articles um, straight away without going a lot of other places. All right, our next question is, do you offer training for ORs or facilities? Yes, we do. So we have um, on educate on keysurgical.com slash education, we have webinars and other things on there. Also, each of our reps, our sales reps, are very they're experts in their area. They spend lots of time reading the articles, doing the research, not only on the equipment, but also on best practice. So reach out to the sales rep in your area. If you don't know who that is, there's an incredible map on our website. You can find who is your sales rep for the OR? So reach out to them and see if they're able to do that and reach out to me at education at keysurgical.com. And it's free. We offer free virtual in services, yeah. I should say. Excellent, thank you. Everyone likes that word. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay, next question is, how do you evaluate nerves post-procedure? Sure. Um, Absolutely. Mo you know, movement and sensation are, are the first two things that come to my mind. The other thing and why I kind of stated and restated that statement of, well, I've always done it like this is because sometimes when you're working in the OR, you can't, it's not until that patient is in PACU or on the floor that they're awake enough to tell you about some sensation or that they notice maybe. So, Really, really following the guidelines can help avoid some of that. But again, movement, sensation, all of all of your post-procedure evaluation of that patient is going to communicate to you um, if there's been any injury at that time. Um, but follow, follow, follow those guidelines. All right, our next question is, how alert should the patient be in the prone position during a procedure? Well, it depends on the procedure and that, uh, my follow-up question to that is if a patient's inducted, like it, under, induct, under anesthesia, they're not going to be alert. Now, if you're placing a patient in prone position on the floor, um, that's a little bit different, but once again, really talking to your team at that time. Um, who is the anesthesiologist? Who is the physician on the floor? In the OR, the patient's not gonna be alert if that answers that question. Okay, great. Our next question is regarding padding. Are you always referring to padding in addition to the OR mattress pad? Yeah, a lot of the guidelines call out specifically adding extra padding to the mattress. Some of the guidelines, like for the heels, AORN calls out using elevating, using a gel or a pillow and not using a heel positioner and different things. So the guidelines all call out pretty specifically for different body parts, a generalization of what should be used, but additional padding in those areas is typically what they say. Thank you, Michelle, for a great presentation. I would like to encourage everyone on the call to visit today's sponsor, Key Surgical, to learn more about the products they provide to our industry. Please visit keysurgical.com. 
A quick reminder that you can obtain your certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your 1CE hour, and you will be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We will be back in two weeks with another webinar. Visit ortoday.com slash webinars for more details and complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a great day.